Vitamins, minerals, and amino acids. What do these three categories of nutrients have in common? I'll give you a hint. They make up the entire human body and are arguably the most important nutrients to consume. Plus, most of us are not getting enough of them. Hi, I'm Nick Urban, host of the Mind Body Peak Performance Podcast. And today, I'm excited to be diving into the world of amino acids with you. Now, if that word mostly just brings you back to your memories of high school biology, hang in there. I think after this conversation, you'll be convinced that these are a very important class of nutrients to focus on. In fact, for me, this was one of those supplement game changers in terms of the way I look, feel, and perform on a daily basis. Once I switched over to using the right kind of amino acids, there was an almost immediate difference. And that was despite me following a high-protein diet. In this episode, you'll learn why a high-protein diet does not guarantee that you're getting enough of these nutrients, why virtually everyone stands to benefit from supplementation, and how amino acids can play a pivotal role in your health, your performance, your longevity, your recovery, indirectly for your immune system, for your brain health and performance, for your energy, and of course, for your body composition, your weight loss efforts, and your maintenance and even building of lean body mass, especially as you get older, or if you're following a plant-based diet, or if you're just putting a lot of strain and stress onto your body. Joining us on the show today is one of the world's foremost experts on all things amino acids. His name is Dr. Robert Wolf, or Bob for short. He served as a faculty member at Harvard Medical School for nine years. He was the chief of the metabolism unit at Shriners Burns Hospital. And for the science nerds out there, Dr. Wolf has published over 452 peer-reviewed research articles, 126 review articles, three books, and has five patents. His papers have also been cited over 50,600 times since 2011. Dr. Wolf has also been continuously funded by the National Institute of Health throughout his entire career. His research has focused mainly on muscle metabolism, particularly as affected by aging and life stressors like injury, sepsis, and cancer. Dr. Wolf is the director of the Center for Translational Research in Aging and Longevity at the Reynolds Institute on Aging. If you find this interesting and want to give some of his products a shot, and I suggest you do, you can go to aminoco.com slash urban. The link to that will also be in the show notes. And you can pick up some of their products at 30% off. I suggest giving it 60 days so you can subscribe for a month or two and do a little before and after experiment. Write down how you're feeling and compare notes after 30 or 60 days. The link to the products and a thorough review and comparison to all of the different amino products on the market will be in the show notes, as well as a guide I wrote to the science on essential amino acids and everything they can do for you, at least based on my interpretation of the research. Those will all be at mindbodypeak.com slash the number 140. All right, ladies and gentlemen, sit back, relax, and enjoy this conversation on all things amino acids. Bob, welcome to Mind Body Peak Performance. Oh, thanks for having me. I look forward to it. Yeah, me too. So today we are going to discuss something that's your forte that I've been experimenting with for a number of years, and that is amino acids and a specific type of aminos that we'll touch on in a minute. But before we get started, what are the unusual non-negotiables you've done so far today for your health, your performance, and your bioharmony? Well, when I uh, first get up in the morning, I uh, start the day with uh, an amino acid beverage that's uh, designed specifically to kind of get the engine going that uh, is called Perform that, that uh, 
uh, maximizes the ratio of the neurotransmitters and is uh, like a double jolt of coffee, but only with biologically uh, functional amino acids. And then I do a workout uh, every day for uh, uh, twice a week, resistance exercise, or the other day is uh, some sort of aerobic, either HIIT training or uh, steady state uh, for a longer period of time. And then I work for a, f- a few hours, and then uh, pretty much every afternoon go out and play golf. So uh, so that's uh, an important aspect of my, uh, I don't know what I call it, training, but we walk the course, so it was uh, you know, six to eight miles, depending on how crooked you're hitting it that day. So let's dive right in. Tell me something interesting or unusual or controversial about amino acids that we can use to start this conversation. Well, I think that uh, people view uh, amino acids as something that they don't really understand or that are some kind of uh, wacky uh, nutritional supplement. But uh, probably the the most uh, underappreciated aspect of the essential amino acids is the word essential uh, implies, and that is that these uh, amino acids are crucial for many aspects of daily life, and yet they're not produced in the body. They have to be eaten on a daily basis. And they actually represent the only macronutrients that are absolutely required for life. So that uh, everything that we're talking about today with regard to so-called essential amino acids uh, is only amplifying or optimizing the fact that we eat essential amino acids every day. And, uh, and this is important or actually mandatory for uh, health and well-being. Give us the 10,000 foot lay of the land. You've mentioned essential amino acids, but those are not the only aminos. To sort of start out, why do we need these uh, aminos to begin with is that there are about 3,000 approximately proteins in the body. They're all different uh, uh, shapes and functions, so to speak. They uh, are characterized by uh, different composition related to the specific amino acids that are in each protein, both the amount of each individual amino acid as well as the sequence in which they appear in the protein. And these proteins are in a constant state of turnover, meaning that they're constantly being broken down and resynthesized. And this is a very important biological function because what ha- what this accomplishes is breaking down the proteins that have kind of served their purpose and are, aren't really functioning as well and replacing them with new, better functioning proteins. And the best way to visualize this, I think, is if you think about exercise, where you might do a uh, uh, heavy workout, it'll actually break down some of the muscle fibers, the ones that are already uh, not functioning as well as uh, as maybe a brand new one would, would be functioning. And those broken down proteins are replaced by new proteins that have a better function. How does it work then? You eat a dietary protein, and these dietary proteins are composed of amino acids, the same amino acids that we need to produce the proteins in our body. These amino acids, uh, there are 21 dietary amino acids. There are so over 300 different amino acids, but the dietary proteins are limited to 21 different amino acids that appear in the body proteins. And Out of those 21 amino acids, nine are called essential, meaning that they are not produced in the body and they have to be eaten through the diet. And these are really, as I mentioned, the only real macronutrient requirements that we have to eat. The other 11 or 12 amino acids, uh, debatable on one whether it's really considered necessary or not, but uh, let's say 12 amino acids are called non-essential or dispensable amino acids. And that uh, naming is because they are produced in the body by metabolic reactions. Now, if you were to eat nothing but essential amino acids, at some point, the non-essential amino acids might become limiting because they go into protein as well. And there may be a limitation as to how fast they're produced. But uh, in the context of what we'll be talking about today, and that's dietary supplementation with essential amino acids, uh, you get enough through your normal of the non-essential amino acids through your normal diet that you really don't have to worry about those as part of a supplementation to optimize protein uh, nutrition. The reason we need these essential amino acids to produce the new proteins is that when a protein breaks down, the amino acids that are released can be used to be reincorporated into new protein, but they can't balance the ho- total rate of breakdown with synthesis because about 15 to 20% of the amino acids that are released 
are irreversibly oxidized and excreted in the con- in the form of carbon dioxide and nitrogen. What we've found through our research and what we'll hopefully talk about today is the fact that that defines the minimal amount of essential amino acids that's necessary to maintain daily function to be basically alive, uh, but not the optimal amount of each individual amino acid. And that's what really is the uh, exciting aspect of the use of formulations of essential amino acids to amplify what we know are basic requirements to optimize the nutritional intake so that we can really target specific physiological functions and enhance them with the dietary supplement. I'm so excited about essential amino acids because as I see it, you have vitamins, minerals, and amino acids that basically constitute the entire body and help enable everything to work as well as it should. And you'll hear certain people talk about amino acids as the building blocks of life. And there's also proteins, which are a lot more discussed. And we're in 2023, which has been really the year of like resurgence in terms of emphasis on dietary protein and what that can do for you. Can you summarize what the role between amino acids and protein is? Well, uh, as you said, the amino acids can be considered the building blocks of protein. And proteins have other components in some cases, but Fundamentally, the protein is made of a chain of amino acids linked together in a specific order. And the nature of the protein dictates the uh, amount of each amino acid in the, in its structure as well as the order. And the uh, dietary intake of amino acids is conventionally in the context of dietary protein so that uh, we don't really go to the grocery store and get uh, amino acids uh, lying there next to in the butcher's shelf next to the steak. It's a component of the dietary protein. And uh, as such, where we get our, our amino acids, both essential and non-essential amino acids, is through eating uh, dietary proteins. And, uh, and I don't discount or minimize the importance of that. In fact, uh, I uh, have uh, been part of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the WHO to define protein quality and how well different dietary proteins can satisfy amino acid uh, requirements and a variety of aspects, how, how other nutrients eaten with proteins can affect the optimal utilization of the amino acids and dietary protein. And I think it's, uh, I, I want to be clear that the use of dietary supplementation is only meant to augment the use of high quality dietary proteins as part of our regular diet. That being said, I think the exciting part of our research has been demonstrating that we in fact can really amplify the normal dietary source of amino acids, namely dietary protein with free essential amino acid mixtures. So dietary protein, when you look on the back of a label and you see 50 grams of protein, which is kind of hard to find, but if you were to see that, then that would be a food that contains the essential amino acids as well as some of the non-essential amino acids, meaning you're not getting as potent a bolus of the essential amino acids as you would be, obviously, if you're taking a pure EAA supplement. Well, to some extent, you're right, but there's a, a little wrinkle to that that I think people are really not aware of. The label on a package indicates how much protein is in the product. But first, there are a few aspects that are crucial. It obviously has to be digested and absorbed to be biologically effective. And there's quite a range of digestibility of of proteins. Uh, The animal-based proteins are, there's a range, but somewhere between 88 to 93 percent absorbed. So that's not a big factor, but other sources, particularly plant-based proteins, may be uh, absorbed by much less. For example, wheat protein is about 45% is absorbed. Other dietary proteins uh, go as low as 20% of the protein that's eaten is actually absorbed. So as a starting place, we have the digestibility is not accounted for when you look on that label as to what the source of the dietary proteins is. And uh, in contrast, the free essential amino acids are not digested. They are immediately absorbed through the same process that absorbs glucose so that 100% of what's eaten is appearing in the blood. So that's the first point that is an important distinction. And the second aspect uh, is related to the protein quality uh, beyond the digestibility, and that is that uh, 
that the dante proteins vary quite a bit in the actual distribution and amount of the essential amino acids. And in fact, many, particularly the plant-based proteins, don't have all the essential amino acids. They're considered incomplete proteins. And the animal-based dietary proteins like meat and, vet- and uh, eggs and so forth do have all the essential amino acids, but they may differ in the profile, meaning uh, one, one uh, protein may have uh, 10% leucine, the other may have 15% leucine, so that the profiles may not exactly coincide with the actual requirement or optimal intake of, the, uh, of those amino acids. And of course, with the dietary protein, you're fixed with that. You can't formulate a mixture of essential amino acids in a protein that is what it is. You can to manipulate that to some extent by mixing different proteins, but pretty much you're limited to what uh, that uh, mixture gives you in terms of dietary protein, where with essential amino acid compositions, they can be uh, composed uh, totally in line with the metabolic role that that particular supplement is providing. So, if, for example, if, if you're trying to supplement um, muscle growth or muscle strength, we have done a lot of research to determine what's the optimal formulation of essential amino acids that will maximize that process. Uh, similarly, if your goal is to lower your liver fat and improve liver health, it turns out there's a different formulation of essential amino acids that can be comprised to target uh, that specific metabolic purpose. And that's uh, the real uh, beauty of the essential amino acid formulations is that not only are they directly absorbed, but they also can be formulated to target specific metabolic roles, whereas the dietary protein, even with a highly absorbed dietary protein, it is what it is. You can't really manipulate it to uh, target one particular uh, function or another. Bob, I want to circle back to something you said a few minutes ago, and that is even if you're on a high-protein diet, say I'm 200 pounds, I eat 160 grams of protein per day, I could still be deficient in some very key amino acids, essential amino acids, just because I see I'm getting enough on the back of a label. I'm not actually getting that to where it needs to go because of issues with the profile of amino acids and also the digestibility. So if I was eating a high protein diet and I supplemented on top of that, I might still be just barely quenching a deficiency. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think that one of the uh, accepted uh, parameters that defines the dietary quality of a protein is what's called the limiting amino acid. Uh, and so we just have to step back a little and, and, and think about how proteins are produced in the body. And the DNA dictates the structure of a protein that's going to be uh, produced. And when the process to produce a new protein begins, that starts with a, an, a messenger RNA being transcribed from the DNA, and it becomes the backbone on which the new protein is produced. The way the new protein is produced is, is dictated by the mRNA with the code on this mRNA that calls for a specific amino acid in each chain. So a sequential hooking together or bonding of amino acid occurs that requires that that amino acid, the next in line, is present in adequate quantity to provide the precursor for the protein synthesis. It's hooked on or bonded to the previous one, then the next one up has to be available. So with a, with nine essential amino acids, one of, unless you have a perfectly match uh, mixture, there's going to be one that's the limiting, meaning that, let's say, lysine, you get to the code for lysine and there's not enough lysine there, then the whole process of protein synthesis stops, it's degraded, and it goes back to square one. That is why that, in that case, the lysine would be considered a limiting amino acid, that it's limited and all the other essential amino acids are really provide no benefit because you're stuck needing the lysine and there's no further uh, translation of that messenger RNA unless you can come up with that lysine. So uh, what, we, what we might see, and it's very common in plant-based proteins, is that a pretty good amount of a particular essential amino acid, but if it's not a balanced mixture that has all the essential amino acids, then it's not really going to accomplish the goal of stimulating protein synthesis to any significant degree because you're going to be limited by that limiting amino acid. 
That information, of course, is not available on a product uh, description, but it's a, it's a crucial one to think about because it's mostly plant-based proteins are the ones that may not even be a complete uh, mixture of all the essential amino acids or very low in a particular amino acid. And the idea uh, that is, is put forward is that you should use complementary proteins. So eat one that's low in uh, one particular protein and then eat uh, amino acid and then eat a different dietary protein that's low in a different one and the two together will balance out. And, you know, I remember when I wrote my book about this, the uh, example that I used was red beans and rice is considered like a great mixture. Then I looked them up and actually they're both limited by lysine. So they provide no extra benefit at all of having the two together because they both have the same limiting amino acid. So that there's not only digestibility that we need to think about, but also what's the limiting amino acid and, and how does that coincide with the rest of your daily intake of uh, amino acids? And, and none of that information is available on the, on, the, uh, on the product. That's one of the major real factors behind the uh, uh, use of essential amino acid supplements is that we can comprise it so that if we're eating a diet that isn't particularly high in certain amino acids, that we can supplement that with the uh, essential amino acids. And if, and if you're committed to a vegan or, or vegetarian uh, approach, it's, it's the, uh, the amino acids are ideal because they're produced in a vegan uh, manner so that uh, they can be used with any source of dietary protein and uh, can, can really balance out the... Uh, the uh, intake to coincide with what the actual requirements are for the body. I discovered what are called branch chain amino acids maybe about 15 years ago because they are very big in the bodybuilding and sports performance arenas. And I used those for a number of years before I transitioned over to essential amino acids. Can you explain what branch chain is and why EAAs are better? Let's not distinguish the two in a sense because the branch chain amino acids are leucine, valine, and isoleucine. And they are three important non uh, essential amino acids. And in fact, leucine is the highest uh, percentage amino acid, uh, essential amino acid in muscle protein. So it's a very important amino acid. And it also, in high enough uh, amounts, can trigger the molecular mechanisms that are involved in the production of new proteins. So that uh, leucine is a very important essential amino acid. The reason that, that the valine and isoleucine must also be given along with it is that all three of those amino acids are degraded by the same mechanisms. And when you give a big dose of one, it ramps up that degradation process, and the other two are going to drop like rocks if you don't provide them as well. So, so then any sort of uh, composition of... Uh, essential amino acids is going to contain a significant proportion of the branch chain amino acids. Uh, the reason that they kind of max out as far as uh, useful nutrients is not because they aren't effective in, what, in, in both activating protein synthesis and providing those precursors. It's because to make a complete protein, you need all the essential amino acids. And as I just explained with the limiting amino acids, now you've provided branch chain amino acids, so you've got three in abundance, but that still is irrelevant in terms of building new protein if you're limited by a different essential amino acid that you haven't provided in the mixture. So to sum it up, the branch chain amino acids are important, but they in themselves are very limited as to how much they can promote protein synthesis because you still need the other uh, essential amino acids in proper proportion to be able to string the whole chain of essential amino acids together in the proper order. Now that we have that out of the way, we understand the basics of essential amino acids, total dietary amino acids, branch chain amino acids, how those are just three of the nine essentials. What are some of the roles? I know you mentioned that EAAs are the building blocks of life and that they're used for neurotransmitters. What about hormones and immune system and obviously in muscle, but what are the other like main roles in the body? Well, without a doubt, the main role is stimulating protein synthesis. That's the, the predominant role. And, you know, it's hard to assign priority to other roles, but certainly 
the uh, neurotransmitters in particular are important. And, and, and the, the ones that we're most familiar with is that uh, the amino acid tryptophan, the essential amino acid tryptophan is the precursor of serotonin, which is uh, a neurotransmitter that uh, induces sleepiness and slows you down. And uh, on the other side, the uh, phenylalanine and its breakdown products produces tyrosine, which in turn is the precursor for dopamine, which is the excitatory neurotransmitter that, that balances or sort of jacks you up as compared to the, the uh, tryptophan that, that slows you down. Uh, there are other reactions in the body that uh, essential amino acids play a role some of which we need to be careful about because, for example, methionine, an essential amino acid, seems to be involved in the production of fat in the liver and, uh, and actually can explain why uh, not all obese people have fatty infiltration of the liver and that when that occurs, that uh, really has a negative effect on liver function in a variety of ways. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's essential that we not uh, provide amino acids in a format that is going to overdo that syndrome, particularly in people that are overweight. Immune function is uh, related to a variety of amino acids, not only including uh, essential amino acids, but in particular, the amino acids that produce uh, nitric oxide, and that would be uh, predominantly glutamine and uh, alanine. Those amino acids are produced in part from the degradation of the essential amino acids so that uh, indirectly they uh, provide the precursors but aren't so much directly involved in the immune response. But on the other hand, the anti-inflammatory response is very much dictated by uh, essential amino acids and particularly histidine is a strong anti-inflammatory agent. And it really explains why when you start taking a mixture of essential amino acids, that you uh, start feeling an effect within a few days, even though your muscle turns over very slowly and it really takes a much longer time before you have significant effects in the muscle. But you start feeling better within a few days because of the anti-inflammatory effect of the essentials and particularly histidine. So there are a variety of roles, but I think that it all comes back in terms of formulating approaches to uh, supplement the normal dietary intake uh, fo- is focusing on the ability to stimulate a protein because those are really the, the vehicles by which the amino acids have their physiological effect for the most part. I've dosed histidine, which is a precursor to histamine previously, and I've used that in some of my energy nootropic stacks I've created, and it certainly has like an energizing effect for me. But I think it would be smarter to not just take it by itself because of what you were mentioning earlier about how when you take one isolate how it impacts all the others yeah that's a great point because uh you can also get uh, tryptophan or tyrosine supplements for example which have the same effect they'll kind of jack up the uh the dopamine but uh you know i think these have effects but i guess it's more philosophical because uh you know i have a lot of experience with studies in which just leucine or just the bcas have been given and you know these others aren't as abundant, but I think we can learn from, from those studies. And that is that, that in a physiological sense, nutritional wise, you really don't want to greatly disrupt the normal balance. And the balance of the, all the essential amino acids is really thrown out of whack when you give just one. And it's really preferable to give uh, that amino acid in the context of an overall formulation that's not going to throw all the rest out of whack. For example, if you uh, give a load of tyrosine, you'll increase uh, the uh, uh, synthesis of dopamine and may jack you up a bit. But uh, the, trip to, the tyrosine is transported into cells by the same mechanism that transports the branch chain amino acids as well as threonine. So f- five of the essential amino acids are transported not only into muscle, into brain, but by and to muscle by the same transport system. So when you give a lot of one tyrosine or any individual one, you reduce the uptake of the others, even though they may even be given in the mixture. But if you give a large dose of tyrosine along with BCAAs, for example, you won't get the same effect of the BCAAs because that you've thrown the balance out of whack and the transport reflects the high 
abundance of that one amino acid at the expense of the others that you also need for normal functioning. So understanding that whole principle has been a guiding aspect in the development of compositions to uh, to really be sure that you're not resulting in unanticipated negative effects that occur as a result of an imbalance of all the amino acids in the blood. Yeah, I think it's possible. I've seen some of the papers on just taking the BCAs alone or even just leucine, one of the BCAAs, and some of them show benefits, some of them show decreased performance, and they just don't work as well. I was reading a book by Dr. Carl Pfeiffer from the 20th century was mentioned and how he was using biochemical therapy and like specifically targeting single amino acids to help with neurological disorders. But that was like very much the Wild West then. It still is. There's not nearly as much research on it. So like unless you really know what you're doing, I think it's much smarter just to <laughs> go with a all-in-one formula. Yeah, well, I think that this we should distinguish uh, use of an amino acid as a nutraceutical that's uh, serving a particular purpose, which may be apropos for a disease state or some particular goal versus a general nutritional supplement that is focused on a particular outcome, but that really provides a good general support of the metabolic system uh, as well. And I think those are two important distinctions. But, you know, you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, the 20th century, it goes back a long time that we uh, have known about essential amino acids or amino acids in general. I found an ad from Rexall Drugs in 1938 touting the benefits of essential amino acids. I think that we've learned an awful lot about them, but at the same time, uh, that I think reflects the fact that we've known since the very early 1900s that we have these so-called essential amino acids and that they're crucial for health and uh, that uh, you know various experiments have been done to try to optimize the overall nutritional state by uh, capitalizing on uh, being able to formulate specific mixtures of these essential amino acids. And, and, uh, And the other thing that's interesting going back that far is the fact that when a balanced mixture of essential amino acids is used, there's never been any report of adverse effects. Speaking of balance, I was reading your Essential Amino Acids 101 guidebook, and you mentioned how the EAAs are like a symphony with each individual amino acid being one instrument. And when you have them all together, it's like the conductor that's guiding each of the sections. And it really elegantly displays, explains how exactly this works. And if you want to have a really beautiful, rich, complex sound, you can't just take one or two instruments and put them together. If you want like the full richness, the full effect, you want to combine all of them at once in like a precision tailored blend. That's the way it works. I mean, it's, it's, it seems pretty self-evident, but uh, it, it kind of goes against the current of, of trying to say that these uh, amino acids are drugs, but really just that they're nutrients that all work together and, and all of these different functions uh, are, are ongoing continuously. And I think that's the point that uh, is really crucial about the protein breakdown is that it goes on morning, noon, and night, all night long, 24 seven. And so that, uh, you know, we need to keep on top of it on a regular basis, because it's unrelenting. And uh, the individual components are the important factors, but they will really, you know, just to amplify what you said a little bit, you know, you can have a group of musicians where you have way too many violins or, you know, too many trumpets or whatever, and they drown out everybody else. But to work together, they have to all be really in optimal proportion with each other as well. Tell me more about how people are using amino acids, the benefits they're seeing. You've mentioned muscle or I guess protein synthesis several times. Is that exclusively referring to muscle protein synthesis or is it does protein synthesis have other forms as well? We know the most about muscle protein synthesis because we can actually directly measure it. We can infuse uh, amino acids labeled with a tracer that enables us to follow that amino acid and take a sample of a very small amount of muscle protein and determine how fast it's being produced. So you do see uh, a tendency to refer to muscle protein synthesis and just protein synthesis in general as the same thing, but it's really not. Uh, muscle protein synthesis constitutes about a third of the total protein synthesis that's ongoing in your body at all the time. 
so that the liver protein, uh, brain, heart, all of these tissues and organs have a continuous uh, amount of uh, protein synthesis occurring. And uh, the important thing to recognize is that that uh, skin, heart, all of these tissues can't afford any period of time without the protein synthesis balancing the protein breakdown or you'd start losing that tissue organ. For example, if you went a couple of days without eating and yet and, and in that time, the rate of protein synthesis didn't balance the rate of breakdown of skin protein, for example, you'd start losing your skin within a few days. And obviously that wouldn't be compatible with life. What happens is that muscle is the only real reservoir of amino acids in the body. So how the uh, body maintains protein synthesis in these essential tissues and organs is that muscle protein breaks down and releases the essential amino acids into the blood and they go to these other tissues like skin and they maintain a rate of protein synthesis that balances the rate of breakdown and meanwhile, it is at the expense of muscle protein. So then when you eat dietary protein, a large amount of that dietary protein is directed towards repleting the amount of muscle protein lost in the absence of dietary intake. Uh, a study we did with 92 patients with heart failure, they're divided into three groups, one with an essential amino acid mixture formulated specifically to augment muscle protein in uh older individuals with uh, what we call anabolic resistance, meaning that they really don't get the same benefit from dietary protein as normal. Uh, a second group was given whey protein, the same amount of whey protein as the essential amino acids. And the third group was given the placebo with just the nutritional education. And what we saw was that this particular group of individuals with older people with heart failure have great trouble just mobilizing, walking out to the, get the mail as a, as a big uh, effort for them. In every single subject, uh, it was 32 subjects uh, that got this eight-week treatment. Every single one improved the amount of distance they could walk in a given time and improved leg strength and improved muscle mass. Uh, we saw some of beneficial effects of the whey protein, but significantly less than the effects on, of the essential amino acids. And Kind of alarmingly, the nutritional education group actually got worse over the uh, time. And, they, and that ref, in part reflects just that these people are really debilitated and they're going downhill pretty fast and they don't have time to uh, fool around with uh, uh, waiting for something to be discovered. And and the, the, the important point is that you think about, well, why not exercise? But these people are so limited that they really can't do enough of a workout to really gain any significant function. But the uh, study we're undertaking now is the thesis that this improved muscle function we get from giving them the essential amino acids will get them up to a level that they can now benefit more from exercise. So it's a more elaborate the study that's being uh, going to be done at a variety of institutions around the United States. The thesis being that if we augment muscle function with the aminos, then this will make it possible for them to complete more rigorous exercise and get an interactive effect between the two. And that was really the goal where we started. When we first started this whole idea of an essential amino acid supplement was uh, in a project uh, funded by NASA to deal with the uh, fact that in spaceflight, astronauts lose a lot of muscle. And as the goal of... Uh, reaching a longer periods of time in space was being considered the loss of muscle that occurred over that time period because of the lack of any resistance in anything they did was debilitating to the point where um, what was sort of epitomized that and what really motivated them into action was that there was a Russian astronaut or cosmonaut, they call them, that was in space for a year and then was incapable of even getting out of the uh, uh, landing craft by himself because he couldn't, he literally could not stand or walk because he lost so much muscle mass. And so what the challenge was, though, is not just a nutritional supplement, but one that gave much more bang for the buck because every ounce that went on a space flight uh, mattered in terms of the uh, uh, getting them up, <laughs> getting the rocket off the ground. And so that the uh, the charge was to develop a nutritional supplement that uh, 
that had a much greater impact on retaining muscle and the absence of exercise that could be uh, condensed to a much smaller format than eating a steak, extra steak or, you know, some sort of biological protein. And, you know, that was where the whole concept of kind of uh, getting more bang for your buck evolved into the essential amino acid supplements, which turned out to be very relevant to older people as well, because one of the reasons that older people tend to start losing a lot of strength and mobility is that they just don't eat as much. And, uh, you know, to, to try to say, well, you should eat this protein supplement, it just doesn't happen. They don't really want to sit down and drink a big glass of whey protein. And so the goal of making a very targeted nutritional supplement that could be easily ingested uh, was was an important aspect of developing the, the uh, formulation that, that ultimately uh, 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 has been a great help to older individuals. I didn't realize that about NASA. And I've also actually done something similar. Whenever I travel, I always bring essential aminos with me because they are such good like nutritional insurance to make sure that I'm getting what I need on the road when whey protein container for 30 servings would take up way too much space very inconvenient it's just like not at all a good experience and i find that when i have my aminos with me that i'm able to like sustain my work better i'm less worried about missing a meal if it happens i prefer not to and my energy stays more steady i feel more satiated if i can't get enough protein in a single meal there's just like so many reasons to bring it with me I did mention earlier that uh, even if you're eating an insufficient dietary protein diet, you still can smooth that out with the essentials. I hate being on the road and being the one who orders a second and third entree at the restaurant simply because I can't get enough protein to actually stay full. So this has been a lifesaver for me to be able to do that and be able to like have one entree and then supplement with a little bit of extra aminos and then feel good after the meal. And I think this is also probably the single most important supplement for athletes as well because i thought it was creatine for a while and certain other things i thought it was bcaas but those have their pros and cons and not everyone can use creatine if you already eat a lot of red meat for example you probably already get a, get enough creatine in your diet and these just seem like universal across the board for almost everyone Absolutely. They're, re they're required nutrients. None of these other things you know, are required nutrients. Creatine can be produced in the body. At the same time, it's possible to combine things. You know, it, uh, if you are doing uh, sports that require rapid bursts of energy, being sure that you have adequate stores of creatine is, is you know, very useful. But it doesn't change the need for the essential amino acids or the impact uh, of the essential amino acids. So that when you have these uh, specific uh, targeted things for your particular event or whatever reason you have for wanting to take that supplement, for the most part, they're not going to interfere at all with the essential amino acids because the essential amino acids are the fundamental component of, of why we eat food. In the whole muscle-centric medicine paradigm, there's a lot of people out there who actually believe that muscle is the most important thing you can do for your health, your longevity, et cetera, et cetera. And based on our conversation, I'm thinking this is because of the pool of amino acids that your muscles have. And if you deplete that too much, too long, then your body no longer has the required fuels, the substrates to build the organ organs and tissues and everything else it needs to build. So if you, by increasing those stores, whether it's from working out or ideally working out and getting enough amino acids in your diet and supplementation routine, then you're setting yourself up for success over the long term. The most cited article I've written in my career was titled The Underappreciated Role of Muscle in Health and Disease. And it really hit on that exact point that muscle uh, provides a very important role in many respects. For example, bone health is directly related to muscle strength because the uh, tension applied on the bones by muscle contraction is a crucial aspect of bone strength. Uh, there is just a whole variety of uh, ways in which the, the muscle is important. And, and as I described earlier, when we're not eating protein, the muscle breakdown provides those amino acids that are needed to maintain protein synthesis in tissues like heart and skin and lungs that can't do without the protein. This is so effective that the plasma amino acid levels, particularly of the essential amino acids, remains constant for days and days 
in the absence of any dietary intake of protein, that, that the muscle breakdown is so well tuned to the need of other tissues to, to produce protein in the body that the muscle just keeps breaking down and maintaining those plasma levels constant. And it's an interesting thing, which uh, goes back to World War uh, to uh, the early 1950s, where there was a big conflict, which I guess continued for years and years in Ireland, uh, where the IRA uh, people were being uh, jailed and, and several went on hunger strikes. And uh, in the context of those hunger strikes, they uh, got asked a scientist to take blood samples with them throughout the course of starvation so that some benefit would come out of their sacrifice. And uh, what was interesting was that the uh, plasma amino acid levels stayed constant up until two or three days before they died. And then when the muscle depletion was so severe that it could no longer maintain the plasma amino acid levels, and they started to drop, then the individuals died within a day or two of that. So that it truly is uh, a central part of life. And uh, as you get older, you're almost surely going to have events that are going to prevent you from eating the way you'd like to eat, you know, whether it be some severe illness or injury or something. And and in that time period, you're going to have this breakdown of the muscle protein. And a lot of people are kind of at a threshold where they're doing okay and they don't feel any need to improve their muscle mass or function. But then when they have some calamity and don't do anything for a while and they don't eat uh, properly and get no exercise at all, they go over a threshold to where now their daily activity is absolutely impaired by lack of muscle mass and strength. And, and it, so it's one of those things that you just have to have faith in believing that I need this muscle because, uh, once you reach that point where you've depleted it, it's really hard to put it back on. Much easier to maintain it with uh, proper exercise and uh, nutrition than it is to regain it. Yeah, the muscle can be considered an organ of longevity. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. So we've talked about some of the performance benefits, how it can actually improve workouts. It can facilitate building strength and muscle also, I know that it can help with recovery based on muscle protein synthesis and other stuff. There's two aspects of uh, amino acid supplementation related to exercise. To first understand that during exercise, and particularly resistance exercise, but also aerobic exercise, you have an accelerated breakdown of protein that occurs because of the effort. And if you take amino acids before the exercise, and an optimal formulation helps, but any kind of mixture will do something. If you take it before the exercise, that really slows that process down of the breakdown of muscle protein by a net loss of protein because you're able to continue to synthesize protein during the exercise itself. So taking amino acids before the exercise is important, but then after is also important. Not the, 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 the beneficial effect of before is actually greater than after, but after is crucial because the muscle now is primed to respond to the amino acids. And, and that priming lasts for a whole 48 hours after resistance exercise where the muscle is really geared up to respond to increased amino acid intake, but you've got to provide the building blocks. Once you add the amino acids to the stimulatory effect of the exercise, you get this amplification where the combined effect is greater than either one by itself. Okay, so that's the performance and recovery side. And then we also have like the mental health, cognition, like support because it's providing the raw fuel for the brain to create brain chemicals and neurotransmitters. And then what else? What about energy? Amino acids do provide some amino energy, but uh, there's actually a very efficient system that minimizes the oxidation of the essential amino acids so that as far as energy, we can improve the perception of energy quite a bit through a product like Perform that, that amplifies the, re the relationship between dopamine and uh, tryptophan and, and serotonin so that you get a, a much more alert uh, wakefulness. But as far as substrates for energy per se, 
the amino acids are probably not the best source for energy. They're the source for uh, staying alert. But the other thing which uh, we've shown now in four different clinical uh, groups, and that is the beneficial effects on liver health. And it's reflected in uh, a variety of parameters that indicate uh, liver function as well as the amount of fat stored in the liver and its ability to uh, process glucose properly and, and perform all the metabolic bases. And this is the one uh, that's really, in, in one respect, most exciting because uh, we just got a large grant from the NIH, National Institutes of Health, to, to uh, perform a, a much more in detailed study of this process. And uh, in concert with that, we're able to get the uh, formulation approved by the FDA as a uh, new drug, even though it's a nutritional composition of, of essential amino acids, that the big benefit of that is that it, it gives, comes along with the FDA stamp of approval if you, uh, you show the beneficial effects in the, in the study. For longevity purposes and fasting, we've already established that this is going like, to help increase the pool of amino acids, which has knockover effects into other areas. But do you see that people combine this to great success with, say, 24-hour fasts or intermittent fasting or anything like that? We don't really have data. The rationale for the, uh, the beneficial effects of fasting is uh, multiple and can, uh, in particular, revolve around uh, an acute increase in ketosis, which is not affected by giving essential amino acids, so that it should certainly be possible in fasting to maintain the beneficial effect of the fasting while simultaneously maintaining muscle mass to a greater extent. There's a certain adaptation that occurs with fasting so that the muscle, well, the body protein breakdown slows down some. And this helps uh, alleviate the breakdown in muscle protein that would normally occur in the absence of dietary intake, but it still occurs. And this can be avoided with a, a balanced mixture of essential amino acids that will not disrupt the uh, ketotic state induced by the fasting. So, so it should work well, but we have no actual experimental data to address that. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, at this point, people that are doing that sort of approach need to uh, kind of experiment on their own with it because uh, uh, I th- it makes sense. And I think that, it, uh, you know, I feel I'm right, but, uh, you know, we only uh, act on actual experimental data. Okay, on to something that I've wanted to ask you about, and that is the essential amino acid profile of the products you, you carry because your profiles are unique and they are the subject of use in clinical research. And when I did my own research into other products in this category, I saw profiles of the ratios of each of the different aminos all over the place, like not even remotely similar between companies. So I'm curious how you decided on each of them. And the way I saw it, I'm not sure if this is accurate, but I see each amino acid individually having a couple different primary roles. You've already elucidated some of them in this conversation. And then based on that and the outcome you're looking for, you would choose the appropriate ratio. The four different products our company sells are all patented. So all of the uh, different formulations have different profiles specifically targeting uh, a metabolic process. And in and, and the same vein, though, that they all have some effect in terms of enhancing protein synthesis. Some are more effective than others, but that's always a background aspect of all the uh, formulations. So if you target... Uh, Stay, getting up for a workout, for example, with Perform, the balanced mixture there still will provide some stimulation of protein synthesis as well as optimizing the dopamine to uh, uh, serotonin ratio. So that's true of all the formulations that any combination of essential amino acids will have some beneficial effect on protein synthesis. If that's the specific target, then we need to really look at exactly what the circumstance is because some exercise will activate mTOR, others will not have that kind of an effect. Uh, how do we provide enough of the uh, amino acids to overcome the lack of activation in insulin resistant states? All of these different sort of metabolic issues 
we started first from the clinical standpoint and then uh, der- develop the formulations based on what we would anticipate. And then, of course, the final proof of the whole issue is the most important, and that is testing the formulation over a period of time in the actual clinical setting that it was designed for. And I think that's where we really have uh, distinguished ourselves from other f- compositions where we have uh, no products that haven't had significant amount of actual clinical research in the uh, looking for the actual physiological or clinical outcome that we're targeting. That's huge. So many companies don't actually test, actually majority of supplement companies do not test their final products. So you don't actually know if what you're reading in the research is going to translate to you when you go to apply it and actually consume the product. What I heard you say a minute ago is that with all of your products, they all are going to stimulate muscle protein synthesis to some degree and then the exact composition and formula within each of them is going to give a special favorable boost towards a specific thing say to towards performance towards liver health towards recovery etc exactly also in your book i noticed that you mentioned something that was a debate amongst in my circle and that is why not just use the same composition of essential amino acids that you find in muscle if you want to stimulate muscle protein synthesis maximally? Yeah, well, that was actually the starting place with the NASA studies. Uh, And there are a couple of snags to that logic. Uh, And that is that, so if you eat a composition exactly equal to muscle protein, that they they don't appear inside the muscle cells exactly in proportion to what you ate. Because the transport, the amino acids go into the muscle cells by active transport. They're working against the concentration gradient. And those transporters vary considerably in how rapidly they transport amino acids into the cell. For example, lysine is transported into the muscle cell less than a third as fast as phenylalanine is. And so that uh, these different transport rates mean that whatever you've eaten doesn't actually correspond to what becomes available for the protein synthetic processes within the muscle. And furthermore, there are aspects of the uh, muscle metabolism of amino acids that differ. So that if you increase all, let's say that you get this formulation right and the transfer rates are exactly the same for all of the amino acids, some of the essentials, most notably the branched chain amino acids, are oxidized in muscle and others aren't, like phenylalanine and threonine. So that you have to provide extra of the branch chain amino acids to get the same effect because some of the branch chains that you give are going to be oxidized in the muscle and, and therefore the other essentials are going to be disproportionately greater than the, ascent, than the ones that were oxidized. So that all of these factors have to be taken into account to actually come up with the uh, profile that, that actually corresponds to what's needed to produce new muscle protein. Let's talk a bit about dose, because when I was on the road, I only had space for one container. I brought life with me, I believe it's called. And I was using that a couple times a day just to get in some extra aminos. And one of the things I liked about it is you don't need a huge jug. You don't need 20, 25, 30 grams of, or maybe even more, maybe even 40 or 50 grams of powder just to get one serving. Well, there's a dose effect. So up to a point, the larger the dose, the bigger the effect. But we've shown a very robust, consistent response to as little as uh, 3.6 grams of the essential amino acids of life, which corresponds to about five to five and a half grams or one scoop. So that that's uh, a small amount that can easily be just chugged down. And you and particularly if you take two do- you know, doses separated twice a day, that that's going to give a nice response. Up to 15 grams, you consider you continue to get a bigger uh, response, but it's kind of cur- curves off so that as you get close to that maximum dose, it's not going to be any more effective than a smaller dose. So anything more than about six or seven grams of the essentials, which is going to be two doses, that's going to uh, uh, pretty well maximize the effect, which is uh, going to be much greater than any amount of dietary protein you need. And so if I'm taking two doses per day, let's just say one to two doses per day is good enough for most people, 
would I be best suited taking it first thing in the morning if I'm not eating breakfast? And then again, right around training? Or if I'm not eating enough protein at a meal, is it better to take it one of my doses then to like really just make sure I'm maximally engaging muscle protein synthesis? Or is it better to spike muscle protein synthesis more times to a lesser extent throughout the day? Say like one dose in the morning, I have brunch, one dose in the afternoon, then I have dinner. How would you take it? Well, I think that a lot depends on what's convenient and what your lifestyle is. I think that taking uh, taking one in the morning, well, in my case, coincides with a pre-workout uh, uh, dose. So, uh, but even without that, I think that it, it's beneficial because you've gone the whole night without absorbing any kind of essential amino acid uh, intake. So, first thing in the morning is, uh, I think, absolutely uh, uh, a good point. And then sometime mid afternoon, uh, you can do it with a meal, though. Uh, it will still have a beneficial effect, but you run the risk of reaching uh, the maximal effective dose uh, with the dietary protein plus the meal. When you take the uh, small dose in between meals, there's no competition. And uh, so uh, I think it's it's far preferable to do it uh, between meals. And you can even do it uh, before you go to bed as well. But the disadvantage of doing it before you go to bed would be that uh, the potential that you kind of get jacked up before you go to bed. And that's why the only one that would be useful before bed would be heal. Uh, and that's going to prolong. Uh, and that has a mixture of amino acids plus whey protein, and that will prolong the effect over a few hours of bedtime. But from a practical standpoint, what I recommend and do myself is first thing in the morning and, mid- and mid-afternoon. Simple enough. And then last on this front, before we start to wind down, that is if there are any cofactors or absorption enhancers. I've seen certain products use like Astrazyne, something like that to apparently increase the ability to utilize amino acids. I'm not sure if it's necessary. And if that's not, then what are the possible things that we can use to amplify the benefits? I'm in New Zealand now and we did a study using kiwi fruit prior to eating a beef meal. And uh, the kiwi fruit contains an enzyme called actinidin, which is also in pineapple and guava and a few other uh, tropical fruits that absolutely digests uh, protein better. And it definitely speeds the point of digestion. And, and uh, the only thing is that it doesn't have a big effect on the amount absorbed because uh, with meat, meat sources, they're pretty completely absorbed ultimately anywhere, but it clears the stomach much quicker. Uh, that would be similar to, to the substance you're referring to. But keep in mind with the amino acids, free amino acids, they're directly absorbed. There's no digestion involved. So they're 100% absorbed. So the question is, uh, is it better to, to eat the aminos with some source of energy as well, like carbs or uh, fat? And we know, for example, that the research we did showed that with the same amount of dietary protein, whole milk actually stimulated a greater response than skim milk because of the extra fat. And we also have shown that carbohydrate added to aminos will amplify the the amino effect. However, you have to think about dosages because, for example, with the carbs, the response to three grams of essential amino acids was was compared to the response to 100 grams of carbohydrate. And adding 100 grams of carbohydrate to three grams of um, essential amino acids was the same as adding just another three grams of the essentials rather than the 100 grams of, uh, of uh, carbs. So the bottom line is the energy substrates can have a beneficial effect, but it's nowhere near as effective as just taking more of the aminos. But... Uh, if you're trying to both store up energy as well as uh, uh, meet your uh, essential amino acid requirements, then you absolutely can take them together. But I wouldn't look for anything to have a lot of effect. We focused almost entirely on just the direct effects of the essentials. They don't really require other components to uh, to have maximal effectiveness. And for reference, the calorie content of each of these is incredibly low like each serving of all your products is very low 
Yeah, well, that makes it ideal for uh, meeting uh, EA requirements without all the obligatory calories that go along with meat or whole milk or other sources of high quality protein. And if someone wanted to work on their weight, to uh, work on weight loss, this might not directly stimulate weight loss in the same, same way that certain other things do. But if they were using the GLP-1s or anything that make the weight loss better and more effective, it seems to me that amino acids could help reduce the amount of weight loss that's coming from lean body tissue, which you, don't, you really don't want to lose when you're losing weight. Absolutely. And we've published three different papers showing that uh, meal replacements with uh, based on EAAs is uh, more effective uh, in terms of sparing muscle and promoting fat loss than other even high-protein products. The problem with uh, the high-protein products is that the total caloric intake to get enough protein with the high uh, the caloric the caloric intake that goes along with that makes it hard to lose the weight. Where, as you pointed out, with the EAAs, you're eating almost no calories, so that it's effective without really increasing the caloric burden. Awesome. Well, Bob, I have one more question for you, and then I'll let people know how they can get in touch with you, and then we'll start to wind this one down. And that question is, if there was a worldwide burning of the books and all knowledge on earth is lost, but you get to save the works of three teachers, who would you choose and why? Well, I think the first person was when I uh, graduated from graduate school, I went to work as a postdoctoral fellow for uh, John Spitzer, who... uh, was uh, really instrumental in, in giving me an enthusiasm for research. You know, I tend to go through graduate school just with your head down, just grinding away, and it's absolutely not exciting. I then uh, shortly went to Boston and, and, and to, became a faculty member at Harvard Medical School, and I was at the Shriners Hospital for Burned Children and really uh, could see that the muscle loss was a tremendous uh, problem that not only hindered recovery, but also uh, survival, but recovery to any kind of normal function, and that I really hadn't been trained in any aspect of this, and audited a class by a world-famous guy at MIT named Hamish Monroe that was tremendous uh, inspiration in terms of understanding all the aspects of protein metabolism and uh, and in metabolic uh, regulation as far as protein metabolism would go. And I guess the third point I'd have to mention my wife, who I worked with me for several years, and uh, uh, she's probably listening, and she'd kill me if I didn't mention her, mention her as, as being one of the most important. But she really has been, because uh, my training was very much more in basic science than nutrition, and she uh, has a degree in nutrition and, and is very tuned into how do these things relate to what people actually eat. And so I, I think those are probably the three people that have had the biggest influence on me. Beautiful. Okay. If people want to connect with you to try some of your AminoCo products, how do they go about that? The Amino Company has a website, which is the best way to look at the website. If they have a specific question uh, regarding uh, you know, what we've covered here today, they can email me directly at my email address or through the, through the uh, uh, Amino Company webpage. Uh, I think there's this place you can uh, ask questions, but rrw2 at uh, live.com is my email address. And uh, provided that uh, the questions don't get too unwieldy, I, I usually am able to get to those in a reasonable length of time. Awesome. And you and your team set up a code urban. So if people use that, I believe it saves them 30% on their order. Thanks for doing that. And now on to the quick rapid fire round before we call it a day. Okay. What are some of the biggest myths around essential amino acids? Well, I think that the, probably that the uh, branched chain amino acids are something different from essential amino acids, and that uh, uh, as I explained, they're just there. They also are essential amino acids, but only part of the total equation. What's one thing the Amino Code tribe does not know about you? Well, since my son is the uh, president, he knows a lot about me, but. Uh, uh, probably not. They're probably unaware of the uh, the amount of uh, of effort and interest I've had in doing different sports in my life. And how would you like to wrap up this episode? If people have made it this far, any final messages for them? Well, congratulations for hanging in there. I guess would be the first uh, first point. But uh, 
I, I think that what I really would leave as the message is to take a look at the Minico website or in the book and educate them, uh, themselves as to why these different formulations of amino acids are distinct from other products that are available and the kind of research that has gone into the, their development. Yeah. I've long said that protein, just increasing the amount of pro- dietary protein we're all consuming is one of the most important, impactful things we can do for our health. And to make it even easier and more potent, instead of focusing on really getting more and more and more dietary protein, which I hate to say, between like 60 and 80% of the people that I work with tend to drastically overestimate how much protein they're consuming. The simple solution there is just to start adding some essential amino acids and after a month of use to see how you feel, see how any of your biomarkers have changed, whether it's in a lab test, whether it's your weight, whether it's your arm size, you name it. And so thank you for creating products that help people accomplish that. And without the guesswork of random formulas with like actual peer reviewed research behind and powering each of the products you've created. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. I'm Nick Urban here with Dr. Robert Wolf signing out from mindbodypeak.com. Have a great week and be an outlier. I hope that this has been helpful for you. If you enjoyed it, subscribe and hit the thumbs up. I love knowing who's in the 1% committed to reaching their full potential. Comment 1% below so that I know who you are. For all the resources and links, meet me on my website at mindbodypeak.com. I appreciate you and look forward to connecting with you. As a reminder, the information in this video is for information purposes only. Please consult your primary healthcare professional before making any lifestyle changes.